today before you the immeasurably greater opportunity to help bring about the liberation of man's spirit in every part of the world. Song Mei Ling, also known as Madam Chiang Kai shek, was a woman of immeasurable courage. She had unceasing dedication to her people and her country, China. She was the wife of Chiang Kai shek, leader of the Kuomintang, which was the Chinese Nationalist Party that sought to create a modern and industrialized republic in China during the early 20th century. During the late 19th century, powerful Western imperialist nations divided China into several spheres of influence, exploiting the Chinese people as they took over trade ports, created a ruined Chinese society reliant on opium, and perpetuated a sense of Western superiority over the Chinese people. The country was in shambles. Chiang Kai-shek, known to be politically ignorant, had no means of communicating with the outside world to gain the resources he needed to unify China. Even more so, the outside world, including the U.S., believed China to be in turmoil, rife with corruption, and intellectually inferior. The U.S. had additionally imposed a law blocking Chinese immigration to the U.S. through the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Some of the racist preconceptions about the Chinese during the 19th century, the idea that um, Chinese were not equal to whites, that it was unfair labor competition, and the effort to exclude them was part of a general kind of xenophobic and racist uh, cultural and political uh, movement. Then Chiang Kai-shek met Song Mei-ling. Song Mei-ling was born on March 5th, 1898, into a strict Methodist family. She was influenced by the social justice teachings of John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, who emphasized the importance of social service, such as creating hospitals and orphanages. Also, since Mei-ling's father was educated in the U.S., Mei-ling was raised to embrace Western ideals, freedom, and justice for all people. While in the United States, Mei-ling attended Wesleyan College and Wellesley College, gaining two valuable assets, her proficiency in English and her respect for democracy. With her two assets, Mei-ling became Chiang Kai-shek's ideal partner, someone who could become the liaison between China and the outside world. They were married in 1927, and she became Madam Chiang Kai-shek, a leader whose diplomatic prowess, dedication, and charity to the Chinese people during her World War II effort against Japan helped secure an allied victory in the Pacific and changed the U.S. perception of China by laying the grounds for mutual respect. From a political standpoint, Madam's first major trial as the First Lady of China came during the Xi'an Incident. In December of 1936, Chiang Kai-shek was captured by one of his generals because Chiang prioritized the fight against the communists over the Japanese invasions in the north. Chiang remained obstinate and refused to merge with the communists to fight collectively against Japan. Only when Madame arrived was Chiang convinced to accept the demands of his captors, leading to a union between the KMT and the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP. Madame was crucial during the incident. Even young Marshal Chang, one of the captors, told her that he thought that she was heart and soul with the people and that she can adjust the situation so far as the Generalissimo is concerned so that he can quickly leave Xi'an. Madam's role in the negotiations during the crisis also earned her respect from the West. A New York Times article stated that at no time in her brilliant career showed more clearly her penetrating intelligence and the strength of her extraordinary personality than when she frustrated these evil machinations. A year after this merger, tensions between China and Japan snapped, resulting in the Sino-Japanese War. During the war, China still had unresolved internal issues. In an attempt to cleanse Chinese society of corruption, Madam and Chiang Kai-shek initiated the New Life Movement, a cultural reform movement that embraced four Confucian principles and Methodist ideals to promote standards of 20th century hygiene and civic duty. She established the Women's Advisory Committee, a constituent of the New Life Movement, which trained women for wartime jobs as nurses, farmers, or factory workers. Madam was able to build nationalist sentiment in both men and women while modernizing traditional Confucian principles. Even more so, Madam set up orphanages to save the warphans, or orphan children of war, to help unify and educate the country. Her 49 facilities sheltered warphans and taught them how to read and write Mandarin. Due to Madam's care for her nation's future, 
thousands of orphans were given the chance to pursue opportunities that they otherwise would not have had. As a direct result of her dedication to her people, Madam became the catalyst for social reform in modern China. On the war front, China's military needed more resources because they would not stand for long against Japan's advanced war technology. From 1937 to 1941, Madam used her prowess in English and released over 100 articles, speeches, press dispatches, and even published three books imploring foreigners to support her vision for China. In her book, This Is Our China, Madam used democracy as a basis to establish mutual respect between the United States and China. All we can promise is to try to continue the single-handed struggle we have been engaged in, difficult and unequal as it is, for we know that if we do lose, the whole world will lose, especially those nations which are now enjoying the freedom of democracy. In the fulfillment of this determination to fight on, we give our lives and our livelihood. Although moved by her words, Americans were still mainly isolationists. In order to gain American support, Madam remained tactful and did not address American involvement in the war. As a result, Madam initially focused on securing funds for social relief. One major source of relief came from Henry Luce, the publisher of Life and Time magazines, who raised $47 million for Madam's orphanages through his United China Relief. In December 1941, Japanese planes bombed Pearl Harbor, triggering the United States, Great Britain, and China to officially declare war on Japan. However, at this point, China was in need of more supplies. On February 17, 1943, Madam began touring the United States to raise funds for China's army, delivering speeches at Madison Square Garden, the Hollywood Bowl, Wellesley, and ultimately the U.S. Senate and House, becoming the first Chinese national and second woman to address Congress. In doing so, she shattered Chinese stereotypes and created a respectable image of the Chinese. Through her speeches, Madam spoke of China as an equal partner of the great nations, and everyone who heard her determined that henceforth, China should be treated as a great world power. Later that year, Congress repealed the Chinese Exclusion Act. So there were no more Chinese allowed to immigrate into the United States. And because Madame Zhang made an issue out of this during her visit in 1943, it embarrassed many American politicians, and they realized that they were treating China as an unequal partner. Even Roosevelt wrote that passing the bill corrected the historical mistake of Chinese exclusion and was important for the cause of winning the war and of establishing a secure peace. As the wall between America and China began to fall, their people came one step closer to Madam's hope for a future of mutual respect. In the world society that we are going to create, there must be no thought of superiors and inferiors. She confronts the notion of inferiority by showing here is somebody who is very well educated uh, and, and really can talk and speak about the needs that China has and how China can be a full partner with the United States. Thus, Madam was the spark to the mutual understanding and partnership that she had sought to achieve. Through her speeches to the public, Madam emphasized that the Chinese war effort against Japan was crucial for Allied victory. The U.S. government wanted to inspire China and encourage the Chinese to continue their war effort against Japan for its own strategic purposes. So to boost Chinese morale and drag the Japanese in the China theater was Americans' war priority. In 1942, FDR announced a loan to China of $500,000, or $6.6 .6 million today. By obtaining funds for her people, Madam was able to boost morale and fortify the Chinese stronghold. China is aided by the forces that have prevented the Axis from making the junction with Japan through the Suez and the Middle East. This victory is now assured. After World War II ended, the Chinese were able to focus on fighting the CCP. Yet the KMT could not overcome the CCP's superior popular support, and eventually in 1949, Chiang Kai-shek and Madam retreated to Taiwan, where they both built and realized the China that could have been. The U.S. did continue relations with Taiwan. In 1954, Congress passed the Mutual Defense Treaty to enforce U.S.-Taiwan relations. They formed an alliance, recalling with mutual pride the relationship which brought their two peoples together in a common bond of sympathy and mutual ideals during the Second World War. Even when the U.S. repealed the treaty in 1980 and recognized the People's Republic of China as the formal government of China, Congress passed the Taiwan Relations Act to preserve commercial and cultural relations between the U.S. and Taiwan. And so, Madam's legacy and vision for China lives on in Taiwan as it continues to thrive while maintaining strong U.S. relations. 
Madam Chiang Kai-shek truly was a woman of determination, dedication, and diplomacy.